I genuinely believe they're serious. Um, I think the problem is that they find, like every every government finds, is that it's 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 easy to come up with a slogan. It's extremely difficult to change a mindset within institutions that have been doing things for so many years in particular ways. And it always still strikes me, uh, uh, it still surprises me actually, uh, um, that politicians in particular don't consider the minds and hearts issue first, you know, before they stand up and announce these huge structural changes. Because I always think that the best way to make these changes is to buy in the existing systems and ask them to deliver your vision, you know, rather than we're going to change everything, it's going to be fantastic, it's going to be brilliant, it's going to be marvellous, and everybody just goes, yeah, and? So I think they're, I do think they're sincere, but I think they're still falling foul of the old, old problem of not winning the hearts and minds battle first. No, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's, I think big society as, as a brand is probably finished. I think the concept beneath big society, I suspect actually is, is gaining more traction um, because you know, but even deriding what big society is, uh, was was about has actually got people thinking and talking about it. And when you do that, you then inevitably end up with local activists who want to make progress, find ways to actually bring that about. You know, and throughout my whole career in television, one of the uh, drivers was to write about social community issues, but not to actually try and bring about the change themselves, but to create an environment in which the real campaigners, the real activists would get a more sympathetic hearing. And I think ironically, what we've gone through for two years on Big Society is actually creating that climate so that real local activists will actually be able to, uh, well, they'll find a better platform, people will listen to them about what we're talking about. I think City Deal is a, a difficult one because it's, 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 again, it's a classic part of British revolutionary history, which is basically to change titles and carry on, you know. I mean, it's money being funded through and it's got a new title, but a couple of hundred million here and there is not going to solve the problems of cities like Liverpool, where, you know, we have been receiving historically something like a billion pound a year in aid uh, for the last 20 years. and so. You know, so after I've replaced with 100 million, it's probably really not going to do major things. But it's, again, symbolic, and I think that, that's actually important as well. I think the biggest challenge, and actually the biggest opportunity in Liverpool, is actually to constantly remind people about its entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, Liverpool won, all the rest of them are fantastic, but it's the, they're the dressings, they're the they're the bedrock that we have to build from. And I think we have to take a, a bit of a more relaxed view on how we see economic growth coming. And, you know, I think we have to be uh, careful all the time. It's like promise the next thousand jobs or we're going to bring in new manufacturing or a new factory or whatever. I think, you know, if we can encourage 200 people to start up a business and then employ 200 more people, uh, to two people each, you are then talking about a quite a sizable factory, you know, uh, and then from that it just grows and grows and grows. I think the other thing we can be do, we should be doing is uh, saying this has been a generational problem, and we're not going to fix it in two years and three years. We need a twenty, thirty year plan, you know, to reverse what's actually happened to the city. I mean, we've been here for eight hundred years, you know, but it wasn't until seventeen oh seven that the city started to take off, and then. Even up to 1958, there was more wealth in this city per capita than anywhere else in, the, in Europe. You know, and there was that crash in the 60s and 70s and 80s that almost crushed the spirit of the city. So I think we need to say to people, look, that's what happened. You know, and we're not going to fix this in two or three years. We've got 10, 20, 30 year journey ahead of us. But as Kennedy actually said in his inaugural address, we will not fix these things in one term or even in my lifetime but we can make a good start. I think that's really the, the message we should be sending out. At the end of the day, it was just, do, did I really want to, or was I the person to actually take on the system and the structure within this city at this time? You know? And the answer to that question was no, because I, 
of, I mean, I'm, a, I'm at a particular age. I know I've got so many useful years left in me, and thoughts of sitting in a committee room arguing with vested, strongly embedded party, political, partisan attitudes was just not really what I wanted to do. I think we can we can form a better. I, you know, I can form a relationship with Joe, and I can do things to help the city with him being as mayor. You know? yeah. mm -hmm. I think Joe's priorities are probably, as he's, uh, I think he's set out really, is that he's got to hold together uh, the, dom you know, the, the dominant political party, which is the Labour Party. He's got to hold that together while taking everybody through this transitional period when it, you know, it's just not going to go back to being the way it was, you know, it's just not, the cash is not going to come back the way it was. I mean, this is a huge historical and structural change we're all going through. We, you know, we, people still haven't grasped it. I think the public did. The day, the day after Liam and Brothers went down, the public knew what we were into. It's our policy makers who were frightened to actually step forward and say, we're bust, you know. And Joe's got to take his priority. He's got to hold everybody together while we go through this this period, and he's got to find people to work with him, you know, who can actually sort of work in some of these areas to help to try and develop growth from different non-traditional routes. Uh, local taxation, you know, because I think one of the things I found was in 2008. 125 million invested, 850 million impact on the city. Very difficult knowing how that flowed flow, uh, flow back to the public sector. But if we could have put a local tax, tax on things, we could have actually pulled it back. You know? So I think if you look across the American cities, you know, where they have the two bands, they have federal tax and they have local tax, I think given any mayor the, a local taxation power, it's probably the most powerful tool that you could actually have. You know?